Season three of Formative is brought to you by the generous support by Macy's Inc., whose purpose is to create a brighter future with bold representation for underrepresented youth so we can realize the full potential of every one of us. Welcome to Formative, the show where today's leaders are interviewed by the leaders of tomorrow. Today, we're going to hang out with Carlos Cortez. Carlos runs a family-owned restaurant in the Bronx where everything on the menu has one thing in common, chocolate. Let's dig into this sweet show. Hello and welcome. I'm Rachel Gazdick, CEO of New York Edge, and my co-host today is D'Angelo from 362K. Hey, D'Angelo, how are you, hun? And welcome to today's show. Why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm D'Angelo. I go to Hollanda Classical Charter School. I am an aspiring actor. I'm in a lot of plays at school. I love learning. I love helping others. I love having the feeling that I have a lot of integrity. And I love talking to other people, meeting new people every day. Why don't you tell us a little bit, D'Angelo, about where your family is from? So my mother's from the Dominican Republic. My father's from Panama. And yeah, so they both came to New York a while ago. And everything's just been smooth sailing ever since. Great. Well, I'm so glad to be with you here today. So am I. Thank you, hon. And can you tell me who we're going to be interviewing today? Yeah, we're interviewing Carlos Cortez, and I'm extremely excited. Okay, well, let's not wait any longer and welcome Carlos to today's show. Carlos, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. So, Carlos, what is your favorite menu item today at your restaurant? So, one thing that makes our restaurant unique is that everything in the menu has chocolate as an ingredient, as at the restaurant Choco Bar Cortez. But actually, my favorite thing on the menu does not have chocolate in it. Don't tell anyone. But it's basically a sandwich called a Mallorca Iberica. Are you familiar with Mallorca bread? Unfortunately, no, but I think I've heard of it before. It's basically what I like to call the Puerto Rican bagel because it is what everybody in Puerto Rico gets when they go to the panaderia or, you know, the bakery on Saturdays and Sundays. So it's kind of like sweet and soft and we put powdered sugar on it. And usually it's eaten like a ham, egg and cheese or just a ham and cheese. But we make a special version with manchego cheese, ham and guava butter. So it's like a really delicious, sweet and savory Mm, combination. Sounds extremely good. The Choco Bar Cortez is located in the Bronx, correct? Yep, that's correct. We're in the South Bronx uh, on a neighborhood called Mott Haven. The address is 141 Alexander Avenue, and we're on Alexander Avenue and 134th Street. Have you been in this neighborhood before? Unfortunately, no. I have been to the Bronx before, so expect a visit from me or my family soon. We live in Sheepshed Bay, Brooklyn. We own a restaurant in Sheepshed Bay, and yeah. What kind of restaurant? It's everything that anybody would like. It's like Caribbean food with a seafood infusion. We have oxtails, seafood, lobster tails. We have... Basically, anything that you would love to eat. That sounds amazing. What is your favorite thing on the menu? It's very kitty, but I love chicken tenders and french fries. I don't know. It's just like, it's so easy to prepare and it tastes so good. That's fair. Do you prepare your own food? No, my mother usually does that for me. But I do help pack up orders. Nice. So also, little known fact, don't tell anyone, is that I don't cook at all, but I do enjoy eating. So it works out. I kind of get what you go through, but what are the pros and cons of owning a restaurant? Well, I could go on the cons forever, but let's talk about the pros. (laughs) I think one of the great things about having a restaurant is that it's a space where people come and relax and have a good time. It's kind of like a sacred space that, you know, people come and relax and feel better about themselves. So being able to offer that to people is great. And I think one of the things that's really special about our restaurant is that it is a Puerto Rican and Dominican restaurant and people feel at home and they feel represented and they identify with the space because it's kind of designed like Old San Juan. So when people Mm -hmm. come in, they feel like they're traveling, they feel like they're back at home in Puerto Rico or Dominican Republic. I have a question. 
Yeah. Have you ever seen the show Family Guy? Yes. Okay. So would you compare a restaurant to the clam from Family Guy? It's basically like a place where Peter and all his friends go to hang out every day of the week. They feel like it's like their second home in a way. Yeah, that's one of the things that makes restaurants so important to every community. And it's just like, you know, home away from home. And a lot of times, you know, that space is super important for people. Mm -hmm. What? Wait, I have a question for you. Me? What are, yeah, what are the pros and cons of having a formal restaurant for you? Ooh, there is a lot of pros and a lot of cons. But the main one is waking up super early in a way, you have to go open up. You have to like let people in. Is that a pro I, or a con? It's both because it did stabilize me in a way. I used to wake up super late in the summer, but then when my restaurant opened, I would it stabilized me in a way where I have to wake up. I have a reason to wake up earlier. That's pretty practical. I like sleeping in. Same. What is your ultimate goal in your career as a restaurant owner? My family actually, historically, we haven't been in the restaurant industry. We actually have a chocolate manufacturing company that's Mm. based in Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic, which is, Mm. you know, you said your mother's from the Dominican Republic? Yep. So maybe she makes you some of our chocolate. Chocolate Cortez is the name of the company, but in the Dominican Republic, they know it more as Chocolate Embajador. Mm. It's like a hot chocolate rich usually they make it with like cinnamon and spices and we didn't really open a restaurant till 2013 and it was kind of this idea that my parents had to kind of celebrate the caribbean chocolate specifically hot chocolate tradition which you know it's in the trop in the tropics people don't necessarily think that people are drinking a lot of hot chocolate right because it's hot yeah yeah but it turns out that they love it Mm. And it's kind of like a traditional thing, you know, like something that people like to get together with their family, with their loved ones and share happy moments. That's really what it's all about. Part of what motivated me to open a restaurant here in New York and to go into this business. What my final motivation was is because I've been here now for 18 years and, you know, I'm Puerto Rican, but I also have roots in the Dominican Republic as I spent three years of my life there and I go back every Mm. year. We're a Puerto Rican and Dominican company. So for me, it's really important to celebrate our culture. And here in New York, I don't know if you knew this, but one out of every eight people is of Dominican descent. Did you know that? No, but it makes sense because a lot of my friends are Dominican. Yeah, there is so many Dominican people here. And here in the Bronx, one out of every two people is either Puerto Rican or Dominican. So for me... You know, I feel like there's not enough representation of businesses, of brands, and just of anything, honestly, that really does justice to kind of like how many of us there are here. So for me, you know, what motivates me is to really change that narrative and really be more of an example for everything that our community and our culture has to offer because, you know, we're very rich in our culture, in our food, Mm -hmm. in our music, and we got to keep that alive. For me, I just feel like we need more. There's an opportunity to have uh, more spaces, more businesses, more restaurants, more, you know, designers, more actors, more dancers, more, because there's so much of us and so much that we can offer. What happens when you make a big mistake at work? I mean, mistakes happen all the time. And I think the first thing you got to do is take a pause and take a deep breath and acknowledge that a mistake has been making. Yes. And so you got to talk about the what happens, why it happens, and how yeah. you can avoid making that mistake in the future. Because honestly, the way that we learn in this world is the hard way, making mistakes yeah. and learning from them. So always remember that when you make a mistake, it's a learning opportunity. Yeah, I agree. Like what I go by if I ever make a mistake at all is like just reset, recalibrate, and then regroup. I like that. How did you learn that? It's really embarrassing. Why? Do you still want to hear? Yeah. Okay, so I play a video game called Overwatch and a character that I play as, her name is Diva. It's like 
whenever she dies and she comes back or like respawn she says reset and regroove but you can't just regroove right away you have to recalibrate the situation so you added that yeah that's cool so due to the fact that you only have three restaurant locations would you like to branch out and where would you if you want to i definitely want to branch out you know i think we have a really unique concept and we get requests for us to open one in cities all over the world but we are a family business and it has a family name so we want to make sure that we're growing in a way where we can continue providing the best service the best food and doing so in an authentic way so that you know none of that soul is lost and it's also a really challenging market out there so when the time is right we'll open more restaurants and then the second part of your question is where would i like mm-hmm. to open another restaurant i would definitely want to open in the dominican republic i love you too i definitely want to open in manhattan and i think i would definitely also want to open in florida somewhere because yes. there's so many puerto ricans and dominicans yeah but also this is like me dreaming but i would love to open one in japan yes i would love to move to japan it's like my dream yeah same so that's why i want to open one there so i can move there and hang out and be living in this really cool unique culture it's like there's so many different fashions over there and like the food the cuisines that they have look amazing yeah they are so advanced that they don't even just think about the taste of the food they even like go beyond that and focus on just like the texture yeah which is like so crazy to me my life plan is to save up go to college come back get all my family members and just go off to japan and then when we're there for a while go visit korea i love that life family plan you gonna learn japanese a lot of my friends are japanese so i would love to attempt it but yeah i would love to learn it it's like there's so many different aspects about it like greek so and the writing looks beautiful i really want to learn how to write japanese yeah it's definitely a beautiful language really cool but really challenging so you better you start early than later yeah why did you join the family business so originally i was actually going to become a doctor i went to medical school and I didn't know what I wanted to do. So because I was, you know, dealing with figuring out who I was, I knew what my sexuality was, but I didn't really know how to deal with it. Then after I graduated college, I actually realized I was a little bit depressed. I had a lot of anxiety (gasps) because I was dealing with all this conflict internally. And actually I started seeing a psychiatrist who was also a psychoanalyst. Yeah, and it made me really interested in psychology and in medicine because it changed my life. Can you define what psychoanalysis is? Yes. Psychoanalysis is a type of psychology, psychological uh, therapy in the style of Sigmund Freud. Have you ever heard of him? Sadly, no, but I will do my research tonight. Okay, well, you will probably learn about him because he was a really important figure and he's basically the father of modern psychology. It's kind of like an old school style of therapy where you just talk to somebody and they don't say anything at all. (laughs) And then you kind of learn about yourself in that way. Do they make any facial expressions while, like, when you're talking to them or any movement? Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Just like that. (laughs) Okay. So I guess I would have to learn more about psychoanalysis. 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 Psychoanalogy because it's like, I want to be a psychiatrist when I grow up. So I do. Yes. It's like my huge inspiration is Harley Quinn and just like myself. I don't know. Something about like being more to like help people even though you could be going through something at the moment, it just really makes me feel really good. I guess the fact that people feel comfortable talking to me about like their biggest problems is just so heartwarming to me. Yeah, no, I mean, it's really important. 
And I can tell that you're really good at talking to people. Thank you. So, but I also encourage you, you're so young to, you know, explore everything before you make a decision. That's what my mom told me. She said like one minute I want to be a psychiatrist. Next minute I want to be a chef. So everything could change in the matter of a second. Yeah. Well, you have your entire life ahead of you. So you got plenty of time. No pressure. Yeah. When I graduated college, I started working immediately with my family business, but in a different capacity. I was working with our distributor, going to the supermarkets and selling our chocolates there. You know, we're a small brand. We're a small business compared to the giant corporations of the world. And what I learned from that experience is that it would be really challenging for us to grow in the traditional way. So you have to be really creative. Yes, I agree. That's what I learned from that job experience is that we really need to think outside the box because we can't just compete like dollar for dollar with giant corporations because they've got so many more dollars than we do. Okay, so to add on to what you said, would you say that like all the chocolate brands that are like you, are you guys like all equal in a way? You guys sell chocolate. You guys all manufacture chocolate. Do you have anything against other chocolate selling companies? Yes, we do, actually. So one of the things that makes our company unique is that we are involved in every step of the chocolate making process. Are you familiar with where chocolate comes from? How it's made? Yes. So it comes from a cacao pod. The seeds are then fermented. And then they're chopped up and then made into chocolate? Yeah, that was amazing. You know more than like 90%, 99% of the world on where chocolate comes from. So <laughs> congratulations. So one of the things that makes us unique is that, you know, we make our chocolate in the Dominican Republic and in Puerto Rico, which is the same place where it's being grown. And that's something that's really unique about our company because a lot of chocolate companies They are in Europe or in the United States, which are not where cocoa is grown. And so they actually get their cocoa from places like Africa and Southeast Asia. And there are some big issues with, you know, slavery and human rights practices in Africa, specifically around the cocoa industry. And there's just a a big problem with sort of having transparency about the practices of where the cacao is being sourced from Mm. and there's child slavery issues and so that's something that you know we can guarantee with our chocolate that you're getting you know chocolate that's slavery free which is kind of weird to say but it's the truth about the industry and so it's one of the things that again, makes us unique is that we're involved in every step of the chocolate making process. So that kind of guarantees a a, a transparent product. That's nice. Yeah. And it's also more sustainable, right? Because you're making the chocolate in the same place where it's being grown. You don't have to ship it around the world in order for it to be made somewhere else and then shipped again somewhere else. So it's more sustainable in that sense too. How does chocolate become white chocolate? Chocolate? Like you were saying, the cacao beans get fermented and then they get chopped up and then they get processed in this process where they basically, under pressure, squeeze it really hard and then it separates like the fat part of the bean from Mm -hmm. the solid part of the bean. Mm -hmm. So you end up getting cacao butter, which is like what it sounds like, just like fatty white stuff. Is that white chocolate? sort of it's basically that with flavor and then the solid part which is the brown stuff that later gets added back with the cocoa butter to make regular chocolate but the white chocolate you take the dark stuff which has the chocolate flavor out of it and then that's how you get white chocolate okay also like what is dark chocolate so when you make chocolate you can add different things to it like milk and sugar and dark chocolate tends to have less sugar and definitely has no milk. What advice would you give to people who want to open a restaurant? First, what I would say is no idea is a bad idea. Okay. Next thing, cheapest isn't always the best. Never settle for the less. Another thing I would say, I don't believe in like 
bad businesses, just bad decisions that lead up to a bad business. So it's like you could pursue anything that you want, but if you make one wrong decision in the long run, it's going to like ruin everything for you. Mm -hmm. It's like if you're making a macaroni and cheese meal and you mess up and like you put like heavy cream instead of milk, the whole thing is thrown off and it was one tiny mistake. Right. So what you're saying is make sure you've got a good business plan before opening your restaurant. It takes a lot of planning and thought and you need to apply yourself to get anything, anywhere. Oh yeah. Any yep. day. It's like you cannot wish for it. You need to work for it. 100%. Exactly. And also do not stick to one thing. I suggest getting a creative team to always think like no ideas for your restaurant. People will ultimately get bored of eating the same thing over and over again. Keep thinking of ideas, never stop. Totally. You've got to always be innovating and trying new stuff because you're right. Yeah. We get bored of the same thing over and over again. Hey, I have a question for you. So who are some of the people that you look up to today? Today, I look up to like my great after school teachers. And they give me something to do after school other than tennis and taekwondo. And I love that. Yeah, like what kind of stuff do they make you do? We do projects. We like go to the gym. We play basketball. We play soccer. We do art. I love art. We do art like a lot, like more than five times a month. It's always a good time in after school. Who do you look up to? So I think in the past, I've looked up to people who inspired me and who made me feel like it was okay for me to be myself. Because like you said earlier, being your best self is the best thing that you can do for everybody else. And I would say that one of the people that I look up to the most right now is actually RuPaul. I love RuPaul because he is really smart. I agree. Very funny, very charismatic, yes. Yes. and also loves to challenge the status quo. Yes. And I think that that's what inspires me is always to, you know, think outside the box and always be looking at everything around you and wondering, does it really need to be this way? I agree. That's kind of what she teaches me. I just love how, like, she doesn't really care what people say about her. She just keeps going every day. Yeah. She has this famous saying, which I think says, if they ain't paying your bills, pay them no mind. Hmm. So what's really cool, I think, about drag race is queer people who aren't straight or mm -hmm. don't identify as straight. We live in a world. Nothing was made for us right yes everything's made for straight people marriage institutions yeah. everything that you do is kind of different from the norm what the power of being queer is that you get to sort of live in a world where you get to be on the outside and be like looking in and being like hey that doesn't have to be that way like we can make it better yeah and sometimes straight people don't get to have that experience yeah. Uh, because they're in it already, so they don't even have to think about it. But yeah. we are on the outside and we're like, well, that doesn't make sense for me, so why does it have to be that way? Also, it's like nothing is perfect and there's always room for improvement. Exactly. Well, Carlos and D'Angelo, this was a phenomenal conversation. It was really great. So thank you both so very much. Carlos, yeah. we ask all of our guests at the end of the show the same question. Knowing what you know now, what kind of advice would you give to your 13-year-old self? I think the most important piece of advice that I would tell my 13-year-old self is just embrace yourself and, you know, be yourself. It took me 20 to 23 years to really fully embrace that maybe even more than that and you know like you said earlier being your best self is the best thing you can do not just for yourself but for everybody around you and for the world because when you are your best self you are exactly what it sounds like you have the best version of yourself but you have to allow yourself to do that and sometimes it's easier said than done 
But I got to tell you, D'Angelo, like you've got way head start from most kids your age, especially me when I was your age. And so keep doing what you're doing. Um, Thank you. Because you're going to go a long way. Thank you. D'Angelo, what advice would you give yourself for the future? Always be genuine with anybody that you meet. And a reason I say that is when I first met Carlos like an hour ago, I was kind of nervous, but that doesn't mean that I just saw being genuine and nice and respectful to him. So, and now that went a long way because now we know a lot about each other. So true. I appreciate you both so very much. And Carlos, I appreciate you taking the time. I'm, I have been to the restaurant, D'Angelo, with my mm-hmm. good friend, Adelisa, who I've known for 30 years. And mm-hmm. I can tell you that the restaurant and the art, the foundation does phenomenal work for kids. So it was just such an honor to have you here today, Carlos. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I had such a great time getting to know D'Angelo. Have a good day. Thanks for listening to Formative, a production of New York Edge. I'm your host, Rachel Gazdick. My co-host today was D'Angelo from 362K in Brooklyn. He was assisted by Kelly Zumi. Season three of Formative is brought to you by the generous support by Macy's Inc., Our production partner for this series is Citizen Race Car. This episode was produced by Tasha A.F. Lemley. Post-production by Alex Brower. Original music by Garrett Tiedemann. Production management by Gabriella Montekin. Thanks to the whole team here at New York Edge for making this series possible. Never miss an episode of Formative by subscribing to the series at newyorkedge.org slash formative or wherever you get your podcasts.